Congress, I was a college administrator at our state's community college system, Ivy Tech Community College. For those of you who haven't been on a community college system or on a campus lately, these are the type of students you'll see. A single parent who can't go to school all day but is coming in for short periods of time. A young person who wants to work with their hands, become a mechanic, become a plumber. A person I saw, a dentist who was coming back because he thought when he retired, he wanted to become a chef. But I want to talk to you about the last category of student that I saw there when I was at Ivy Tech Community College. We're going to call him Matthew. Matthew worked on the factory line out of high school. He was making $25, $30 an hour. He had a pension. He took some vacation. He put his kids through college. He thought he was going to work on that line the rest of his career and the rest of his life. And then the recession happened. And he lost his job. Matthew suddenly was without a job. And he had no skills to get the next job. <coughs> Manufacturing had become highly technical. It required the use of computers. And so we went in and gave folks skills. We went into those manufacturing facilities, and I saw, we saw people pick up mouses and put them on the computer screens. Imagine that. They didn't even know what that was. Well, if you don't know what a computer mouse is, you can't even go in and apply for the next job. So he needed skills. He needed skills he wasn't even close to having, but he went back to college. And during that time, we saw a massive increase in the number of people coming back and getting their skills in the community college. This was during the recession. And most of them did not have technology skills. The technology skills that they needed to either get back on the line or to even change careers midlife or to just actually just apply for that next job. And so, I have to tell you, Matthew and I have a little similarity because we know the Department of Labor Statistics have told us that 65% of the jobs of tomorrow don't even exist today. 65%. I heard there are some high school kids here. Where are you? There are the high school kids. And we're thrilled you're here. But guess what? Jobs that you want, they might not even exist. In fact, 65% of them don't exist. I learned that as a member of Congress. When I came here, there was technology I had never used. And just recently, yes, I became a Snapchat user. Okay? It gets that reaction everywhere I say it. Why? Because I'm a middle-aged mom. And my 22 and 25-year-old kids, when I told them I was going to Snapchat, they are like, no, mom, you cannot do it. You won't use it right. It's not for you. But why I decided it was for me is because I heard, think about this. The 08 presidential election was about Facebook. The 2012 presidential election was about Twitter. And now, the 2016, how should candidates be communicating with young people? Snapchat. And I have to tell you, I was really pleased to go to a conference and teach my young colleagues, Elise Stefanik and Carlos Cubella, how to use Snapchat. And so I was very proud. But why is that important for us? We need to use these technology tools to communicate with our constituents, to communicate with young people. And now I'm very proud to say, you know, I've got a bunch of Snapchat followers, and they helped me post. This was one of my first stories on Snapchat. And so, why, so that's something that we have in common, something Matthew had, something that I had in common with Matthew. But what do we need to do to create this workforce for tomorrow? What can we do in this room? First of all, it starts out with our pre-K to K-12 system. We have to create a culture of innovation starting very young. I'm very pleased to be representing this, I think, a world-reforming educator named Don Wetrick, Noblesville High School. He has something that he calls the Genius Hour, and he's talking about it all around the country. I just visited his class, and what I learned from these kids is he allows them to follow their passion. They're usually not asked what their passion is. And to take that passion and to maybe solve a problem. One of the students was in California, saw a Tesla actually dead along the side of the road. The battery had run out. That young man went back to his class and, de and developed a solar panel for electric cars. That young man now has a patent. 
that young man was at the bottom of his class rank in that high school. But Don saw that he was brilliant. Don saw something in him that we need to think about changing. Of course we need to focus on STEM education. Of, of course we need more computer science in the classroom. But we need to get students innovating. And it doesn't start at high school or college. We need a culture of lifelong learning, which we talk about in college, but we need to talk about it in midlife. We need to not be afraid of technology. We need to embrace it. And so we need to incentivize and make sure that we have policies in place to allow adults to go back to school to continue their education. And finally, we as policymakers, it's about us. Yes, that's me at my first South by Southwest conference. And I have to tell you, what am I doing? I'm learning how to pay for a cup of coffee with my fingerprint at the visa exhibit. This is the future. We have to embrace it. We as policymakers, and so many of you, particularly from the tech community, advise us as policymakers. We need you to help us because we can't even imagine what's coming. And we don't want to be putting barriers and impediments in place in the laws and rules and regulations that we have. And so I want to wrap up by going back. We need to go back to Matthew, because Matthew is a father, a grandfather. How are we going to be innovating for the future, for those jobs that we cannot even imagine? And I want you to think about what we can be doing for that workforce of tomorrow, because we're going to need it. Thank you.